idea what Bruno said. So I, I feel free to do whatever the heck I please. Uh, and so if you just want to go dancing, I'm fine with that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm ready. Uh, thank you, Bruno, for whatever it is that you said, uh, <laughs> but for inviting me. Uh, it was very beautiful. Um, being in the US, one of the things uh, I have missed is warm rain. And it was beautiful in the morning. I'm, some people might be disappointed that it was raining uh, in the morning, but I found it was very nice. Uh, and I took pictures and sent to my husband because he loves the rain too, especially warm rain in the morning. I didn't actually have to go out in it, <laughs> but still it was nice to look out uh, and it was beautiful. And it's just a pleasure to be here. Um, and my name is Saras, and those of you who have difficulty pronouncing my last name, don't worry about it, you can call me Saras, or Saras, or Saras, it's fine. Uh, I am not really an expert on open innovation. I am what they call in my school, all entrepreneurship, all the time. I have been an entrepreneur, uh, co-founded five ventures, before coming into academia. And those of you who know anything about India, we are allowed more than one life, right? So <laughs> this is my second life uh, as an academic. Uh, and I am already kind of thinking about what my third and fourth life would be. So maybe you will give me some ideas on what is possible. Maybe join the army now. Don't tell me it's too late. Uh, <laughs> they all kind of, no? No, all right. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being so patient uh, I am not sure uh, you really want to be listening to me for 90 minutes in a row, and I don't particularly enjoy lectures. So I'm going to try to keep this interactive. Even though I have a nice presentation made up actually with the help of a student of mine, I have to give him credit as well. Um, I would not mind at all if we don't get through all the slides or get through all the lectures. So I want you to feel free in between, if you want to raise your hand and ask a question, um, no problem. And Bruno will run around and translate for us if you ask it in Portuguese or some other language. Right, Bruno? I have you on board? OK. So just want to say this. And I might actually come down and run around as well. So apologies to the video videographers ahead of time. Um, so here we go. The reason I am here is because I got to do something really cool for my doctoral dissertation. Most of us, when we do a PhD, the most important thing we learn is what we don't want to do the rest of our life. But I am very lucky in some ways that I'm still doing it after like 15 years. And uh, at the research that I got to do, I was very fortunate. Uh, and it seems to have legs. So I'm going to start with that today. Um, so in the agenda, I'm just going to start with the research, just give you a little bit of a taste of where this information comes from, instead of just claiming that this information is good. And then I'm going to tell you the findings. Uh, for those of you who have never heard, let me have a show of hands. How many of you have heard of this word effectuation? That's like three or four people. That's pretty good. And yesterday, we had to figure out whether, whether there was a Portuguese word for it or not. And it turns out that is. Uh, I do not know how to pronounce it, but uh, people did not know until yesterday. So hopefully over the next week or so, you will see on Wikipedia what the Portuguese word for that is. Um, but then I'll explain to you when we get there. And as you can guess easily, it just comes from the word effect, right? Cause and effect. Um, so we'll talk about the process a little bit, get, dig down into the principles. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about how is this different from the way managers think and managers make decisions. Uh, and what difference does that make, especially if you're interested in open innovation? And then hopefully, assuming that we have not had enough questions and we actually have time, we can have a Q&A section of the presentation as well. Does that sound good to you? Yes? OK, I like to hear the audience voice. That is awesome. OK, so let's get started. So the research. Uh, having been an entrepreneur, and as I said, this is my second life, the question I had in mind when I came into academia was kind of a practical one. I really wanted to understand if there is such a thing as entrepreneurial expertise, right? People were thinking that entrepreneurs are somehow different than other human beings, you know, almost like they are a different set of human beings, uh, different species or something like that. 
And also there was this idea that actually there is no such thing. So you have the two extremes, right? This is something special. These are special people. You know, you and I can never dream to be an entrepreneur. And the other extreme is, oh, there is nothing there. It's a statistical artifact, right? Look at the failure rate. Some, you know, a lot of idiots start, a com start companies and some idiots, you know, make money. And then we say, <laughs> and very, very few idiots do actually. So there is no need to understand this, right? So the two extremes of the argument. Having been an entrepreneur, I knew it was more interesting than idiots starting stuff, but it is also not so heroic and different that it is, you know, only special human beings can do it. I really wanted to understand what is scientifically learnable and teachable in entrepreneurship. So in the research, I set out to look at a bunch of people whom I call expert entrepreneurs. These are people who have been founding entrepreneurs for 15 years or longer, multiple ventures, including successes and failures. So if you're not paying attention, everybody has to pay attention because I'm gonna ask you what the definition of an expert entrepreneur down the road, okay? So the definition is long, long, deep, full-time experience, multiple ventures, including successes and failures, and at least one company public, which means you have been through every possible experience you can have as an entrepreneur. Then you qualify to be an expert entrepreneur. So I got 27 of these people, and I gave them a 17-page problem set of typical decisions that happen in a startup. So you have all these people who have lots of experience in multiple industries, all kinds of in industries, including you know, the, not just the usual suspects like software and biotech, but also retail and services, even steel and railroads. And I got all of them to work their way through over two hours um, the 17 page problem set. And I asked them to talk continuously as they did this. So now I could actually look into their heads a little bit. I could actually look across all these people because they're all looking at exactly the same problem set. And because they are talking continuously, I don't let them stop talking during the experiment. I got to look into their heads and figure out what is common across all these people's deep, deep experience. And the results of that became my uh, dissertation. Of course, that is just the starting point. Uh, for those of you in academia and those of you who are scientists, you know that you cannot claim much just doing that, even though it was great fun doing this. In fact, there was a lot of criticism in the beginning that, oh, these are all you know, successful entrepreneurs. They are outliers. You know, why should there be anything common at all amongst these people? And then when I actually found something common, they said, how do you know this is not something that all entrepreneurs do or all human beings do, right? So you get criticisms from both ends. But it turned out that the Think Aloud experiment turned out to be a really powerful tool. And since then, we have been replicating that study with inexperienced entrepreneurs, with students, with expert corporate managers who have no entrepreneurial experience, and also with angel investors and venture capitalists. We haven't looked at policymakers yet, but we are very tempted to do that next. So over the last 10 to 14 years, we have done a series of studies. And then we also wrote 100 case histories, early stage case studies of all kinds of new ventures, successful, unsuccessful, social ventures, technology ventures, ventures from different countries and different historical periods. So this is what we have been doing for the last 15 years. And over the next 15, 20 minutes or so, I hope to give you the summary of all that research. And if you really want to dig deep into that, you have to come take the course that I'm offering tomorrow, nine to one. They are really putting me to work here, you know? So, uh, and I've come prepared to work. So I just want to let you know that. Any questions so far? No? Everybody ready to pull out your checkbook and to learn what is the finding? Yeah? Little bit? No, no. Should I go? Vim, should I continue? Yeah? <laughs> All right. So here we go. So getting to effectuation took, as I told you, 10 typical problems, extract the common patterns across all the experts, and then finally, you know, we found something. Voila. And we call it effectuation. And I'm going to kind of walk you through what this word is and what is contained within that. In a sense, it contains a set of heuristics, 
a set of principles that these expert entrepreneurs have learned through experience that now they almost automatically, uh, you just heard uh, Professor Tell talk to you about automatic, uh, automa automaticity, I, that's a difficult word uh, for no, non-native English speakers to say. Uh, anyway, so for these people, this way of thinking has become automatic. And this is the way look at, they look at almost any problem, whether it's marketing, hiring, finance, you know, any kind of problem in a startup situation. So I'm going to go into the details, but I'll just tell you, start with just the first overall finding. So what do we know? So when you look at what the research found, see, I, I got to get, out, get on a plane and go and meet each of these entrepreneurs and have them do this two-hour experiment. They were not expecting it, no matter what I told them over the phone or no matter what I wrote to them. But I'd go in there and put you know, the tape recorder and the 17-page problem set in front of them, and I would say, please start reading. Uh, and then at the end of the experiment, I would ask them a, a set of questions, like an interview question. And I had lots of other published data and stuff like that. Almost the very first thing I started noticing when I was actually um, thinking through what is going on here. You know, you talk to the first person, you talk to the second person, talk to the third person, and it sounds like an entrepreneur talking, you know, like what is going on? What is the most important thing? Uh, but very quickly, by the time we got to the fourth one, I started hearing this. I hate market research. <laughs> How many of you love market research? Raise your hands. No? Every, oh, nobody loves it. I doubt it. There's a whole bunch of managers from large companies here. I know. I might even get your names, you know. So it's better you raise your hands and be honest, right? <laughs> you have to do a lot of market research. You have to show the market is big enough, right? And you can take leadership in that market. Only then you can go after that market, right? Well, these expert entrepreneurs don't seem to care about that. So you start thinking like, what's going on? If they don't do market research, how do they make decisions? How do they make marketing decisions or any other kind of decisions? And slowly it became clear that it's not that they hate market research, although they do. It turns out that they really have figured out ways to make decisions about a very uncertain future without resorting to prediction, right? So most of what we do in an MBA classroom, for example, we teach you to try to predict better, right? Because if you can predict better, you can control your outcomes better. So market research, for example, allows you to predict what the demand curve might look like, uh, how, you know, what the competition looks like, how big the niche might be, will that market actually grow? You know, all those kinds of things. It's the same in finance, it's the same in hiring. You're always trying to predict the future the best you can so that you can get a better outcome. These expert entrepreneurs are inverting that logic. They're actually saying, I can make decisions in, in the face of an uncertain future without trying to predict it. So here's their logic, right? And this is the word effectual. It comes from that. To the extent that we can control the future, we don't need to predict it. Aha, uh -huh, sounds very cool, sounds very entrepreneurial, right? As opposed to managers, where we teach them to the extent you can predict the future, you can control it, or at least you can control your own outcomes. Sounds very cool, right? How many of you find that's a great finding? Either nobody is listening to me, I'm gonna come down. What did I say just now? What is the point of my getting on a plane for hours and hours and hours and coming here if I don't get any response from you? So what did I say just now? What did this thing mean? Who should I call? The gentleman or the lady? No? Lady says no. I don't know whether to be nice. Do you want to say no, something? No? What did I say just now? At least try. Um, if the first or the second is better, what is the better option there? Something like that. But what does it mean? When that, I say that if to you the extent you can control the future. Yeah, you if you can predict, you can control. If you can control, you don't need to do market research. Ah, okay, very good. So you're satisfied. I've got you got your money's worth. Yeah. <laughs> Are you satisfied? 
No. No. I don't what know. do you want? What do I need to do to earn it? Earn, earn uh, this, your well, presence here and your attention. It's almost like we said we have only two options: controlling and projecting. What else can you do? Ah, that's good. That's pretty cool. What else can you do with the future, my dear? <laughs> well, the future is not there. Maybe you can have a different way of viewing the, the future. For example, mm -hmm. you're there. I know you don't want to speak, but you're doing great. Well, well one is to build a new future. I don't know, <coughs> not only project, but to, to, to build it and uh, try a different uh, view of the future. I told you, she's smart and she got it, absolutely right. The entrepreneur says, you can build the future. It's not that you can control everything or that you have control and therefore you don't need to predict. They're saying, so even with only the things that you can actually control, you can actually create a future. And even more interestingly, they're going to talk about co-creation. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that. So the central finding basically inverts the way we think about prediction and control, which are really important concepts both in science and in business and in human life, right? So when you look at it, the interesting question for me, when you have the first finding, the question became, how can you control a future you cannot predict? That doesn't make any sense, right? So you guys were actually nicer to me by saying, okay, we understand it and it seems interesting, uh, but my advisors, not so nice, right? So they were like, you know, what, what the heck do you mean? You know, to the extent you can control the future, you don't need to predict it, it sounds good, but how do you control a future that you cannot predict, right? So the process and the principles that I will go into will walk you through the way an expert entrepreneur actually builds these new ventures. And you will see very quickly that it's more intuitive than you think it would be just from the way I have presented. But I also want to caution you that these two kinds of logic, effectual and causal, causal being the way, you know, it's about prediction leading to control, effectual being the way of, sorry, effectual being the way that you work with things within your control so that you don't need to predict. So you use non-predictive strategies to get control over the future. So when you look at that, the fact is in, we all need to learn both. Both toolboxes are useful. So in the early stages, if the expert entrepreneurs tend to use it, in the startup and early growth phase, it's particularly useful to be effectual. And then it's particularly useful if you want to get to innovation, if you want to create new ventures and new markets. Whereas as you grow over time, when you look at expert corporate managers, they are much more causal. And then VCs are very, very causal as well. Although we did do a study where we showed the more experienced the venture capital or the more experienced the investor, the more effectual they are in the way they make decisions as well. And then large companies, especially in mature markets, are really, really, really causal. Okay, so I just want to emphasize that it's not one or the other, or one is always better than the other, but the idea is for us to understand that there, is, there are two toolboxes, at least, out there, and they work together, and for us to figure out how to make them work better for us at which time, given which circumstances. All right, so let's go into the process. So this would be interesting, uh, because Professor Tell just talked about you know, starting with goals. And entrepreneurs have been known uh, to be, you know, they're described as visionaries. Not only that, when you ask them yourself, you know, sometimes they will say, I'm a visionary, right? In fact, one of the subjects in my study uh, said that to me. He said, you know, where other people can see only a blank canvas, I can see paintings. And then I go look at the data, he can see no painting. Uh, I, he cannot even see the canvas, right? <laughs> but the way he thinks and the way he makes decisions through that process, he gets to a painting which seems to everybody was always there. Of course, that's a great idea, right? It just, because we tend to look at it after the fact, but when you look at the way they're actually making decisions, they're literally making decisions in the dark and it's very interesting to see how they make those decisions that then ultimately lead them to something that looks like vision to us after the fact. So they just start with 
their means at hand, right? They just start with who I am, what I know, and whom I know. Very mundane. And now, as I told you, we have written a lot of case histories of ventures. And you go look at some of the biggest ventures you can think about, the most successful ones. Uh, my students' favorite uh, thing here is Google, right? If you look at Google and you think about, of course, that's such a great idea. Everybody must have known that it was predictable that this would be a great company. Do you know uh, this, uh, the early history of Google? Who knows the early history of Google? Anybody? Yes? Let me make sure I don't fall off the, yes. I know it just a tiny bit, but as far as I remember, it's two graduate students who just sat down and thought, well, why isn't there a good search engine? And then they started to write the crawler and the, for the, to search all the websites and then catalog it for a search engine, a basic uh, database. So two people who look like us, kind of, right? Nerds with glasses, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So very ordinary people. I mean, you and I could start Google is what I'm trying to say. Um, uh, if we were programmers, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, right? If you and I actually set out to build Google, it would be difficult. But if you, you and I were grad students in Stanford and we had a little bit of IT background, maybe, you know, we could. So they were doing what they know how to do. Do you know whether they knew that it would be a successful company? No, I just think they wanted to be able to search the internet. Yeah, they just wanted to build a web search engine that was way cooler than all the other search engines, way smarter, right? Yeah, like. Okay, now last question, and I'll let you off the hook. How many search engines were already on the market when they built it? I think Yahoo, M um, MSN, and some others, I can't remember. The, no, all of them 65. And the coolest at that time was considered was Lycos. I was at Carnegie Mellon at the time, and people may, paid obscene amounts of money to the guy who invented uh, Lycos, right? So people were not thinking this is going to be the best. This was not the first. This was not pioneering in any way. And the Google founders themselves didn't think it was going to be huge. Their aim was to make $1 million. Uh, and they, within a year or two of be building the search engine, they got a little bit of you know, angel funding, and they tried to go in and s go out and sell the company for $1 million. And nobody would buy it for $1 million. So they were forced to build the company themselves and become billionaires, right? This is what we call a reluctant billionaire. Uh, so when, <laughs> and I can go, I can stand here all day in hundreds of stories, and a lot of the stories are not even in technology. Stacy Speeder Chips, a woman who just, you know, knew how to make sandwiches. Her husband and she, they started a little sandwich shop in Boston. And slowly, because her sandwiches were so good, you know, people would stand in line during lunchtime. Uh, and she realized that a lot of people, there were so many people in line that they would leave, you know, after a while. And she thought, what can I do to actually keep them in line? And so she decided she always had leftover pita bread at night. So she started making these chips and she would just hand them out to people standing in line just so that they have something to munch on while waiting for the sandwiches. And then it turned out that they would come up to the counter and they would ask for the chips. And it took her a while to realize that the chips are where the market is. And then of course she had to learn, instead of being a sandwich shop, she has to learn to actually build a supply chain and build, you know, actually manufacture uh, chips. And then, you know, just a couple of years ago, they sold the company for $90 million to Pepsi. And for those of you who are dis disappointed in that particular piece of information, it's still called Stacy's Pita Chips, <laughs> right? But Pepsi owns it. So we can go on talking about the, these are mundane. Uh, for the people who are starting, they're not trying to do something extraordinary, right? They're doing what they do, and they just start doing the doable, I call it. And how do you then decide what you do? So because there may be several different things that you could do. So here comes the next principle. The way you, if you could do two or three or four different things, how do you decide which one to do? The expert entrepreneurs would say, 
don't worry about you know, expected return and calculating you know, discounted cash flows or net present value or whatever the latest financial algorithm is to try to predict cash flows and value your company. Instead, they say, ask yourself, would you want to do this even if you lost whatever you're putting into it? And what are you willing to put into it? And this may not be only monetary, right? It could be time, effort, emotion, energy. You know, you can think about affordable loss in many, many ways. So each person starts with who he or she is, what they know, whom they know, and they do things that are doable, that are affordable loss for them. So what do they do in terms of actually, so the ideas they come up with are just things that they know how to do already. Then what do you do next? Can anyone tell me what happens next? So we know the first couple of steps. What happens next? You're an entrepreneur. You have sort of an idea that you think you can do. What do you do? You wake up in the morning and do what? Pardon? Make a plan. <laughs> sure. It's your company. It's your time. It's your money. You have to plan ahead now. Oh, okay. And what can I do? Excellent. Let's plan. Uh, how exactly will you plan? Like, how would you go about planning it? Um, I start a draft uh, of my own and consult with experts uh -huh. who can help me uh, improve it. Okay. L let me play the expert for a minute. So what do you want to know? <laughs> what do I want to know? Yeah. Do I need to do this cash flows bl uh, business thingy? Okay. <laughs> business uh, plan with cash flow and everything. If my goal is much above and not for profit. You already decided to do a plan, and may f your first question to me is, do I need to do a plan? <laughs> Let me ask. The, the oh, the projections. Part, project. ah, I can't project if no one knows. It's that's the un unknown. Absolutely. So if if we are in, you know, if we are making Pepsi or Coke, then we can do some projection. If we are doing Nantuck nectars, which is a new kind of a drink, or you know, somebody is going to take Harana and market it in the U.S., then you have you have to think a little bit. Or if you, if nobody has ever marketed something like the cashew juice, like why can't I get that in all over the world? But apparently we cannot. Uh, so yeah, where? Start buying, import. Ah, okay, now he wants me to do the work for him. This is great. You're doing no, great. Here. You live there. You need to import to them. <laughs> ah, okay. So you do not think it's worth your while to actually try to sell it to me. But you think because I'm interested. Oh, you don't, you don't make cashew juice. But if you were a cashew juice maker, would you be considering that? Would that fit into that model? Obviously. Obviously. He said obviously. Obviously, but obviously the entrepreneurs or whoever is doing it have not done it yet. That's what they started. They were doing cashew nuts, and now they're selling cashew juice. Okay. For local market. Okay. Very good then. They started a few years ago. Okay. So Five years ago, they started marketing cashew juice instead of just nuts. Okay. Excellent. So whoever founded that company, you need to come talk to me because I would love to have it around the world. Right? So... You're, you're absolutely right. This is how a lot of businesses get started. Do you think they wrote a plan? For the cashew juice uh, uh -huh. branch? No, I think they were desperate for more money and they said we have that leftover pulp <laughs> that we're not using. We better bottle it as uh, concentrate juice and sell it. Okay, we are getting somewhere, right? Lots of companies do that. They just, even the cashew nuts business, they probably may not even have invented that. Maybe it was a family business. They've been doing it for a while. I don't know this particular story, but I will look it up. I love these stories, so I will look this up. Maybe I will even email you and we'll work on a case together. But the uh, idea here is that you start with something you know how to do, and maybe something like that happened. Maybe they ran out of money, or maybe somebody...